Okay, one last polling question. Get your cell phones out. Uh, we've heard now from the Health Information Exchange. We've heard from the provider. Now we just want to focus on the patient and patient safety. So um, we're asking your opinion here. I think that EHRs have the greatest potential to improve patient care and safety by reducing medication errors, improving care coordination, involving patients in decision making or some others. Again, you're gonna text your answer to 22333. Use the number and the letters to record your scores and let's start now. Okay, so we think that electronic health, health records will help to improve care coordination and that's then followed, uh, that's far, far exceeds all the other answers, reducing medication errors. All right, thank you for that information. We're now going to turn over to Regina, and when you have the stage, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm so glad to be here today. Um, I don't know how many of you are actually familiar with who I am. I am an artist. I am a mom. Uh, I'm a Cub Scout den leader and a Cub Scout Cub master. Um, I worked retail, thank you. <laughs> I worked retail for 16 years at a toy store and a bookstore and handled POS systems doing that job, uh, point of sale systems, if you're not in business. And then I also taught pre-K art for eight years. I'm very familiar with the certification processes within preschools um, and their health and safety standards. And I was the wife of a really, really amazing man named Frederick Allen Holliday II, PhD at American University. Next slide. And this is our before picture. This is our happy family. Uh, this is the holiday season of 2007. I'd worked all day at the toy store. I got home at nine o'clock at night, gathered my entire family up, went to church where Olin Mills was taking pictures of everybody. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm amazed this turned out as well as it did because everybody was cranky and tired and it was horrible. But yay, we have one family picture because of Olin Mills. And it was a beautiful day even though it was cranky and tired because we were all together. I met my husband at, American, at um, Oklahoma State University in 1992, and we were in a scenic painting class together, and he hated it. <laughs> he was a film guy, and it wasn't his thing, and I loved painting, and I loved art. And you know what? We were both procrastinators, so we would stay all night in the theater painting all night long and get these paintings done by the next morning. And the entire time, we would just be fighting and arguing, and after a whole semester of this, we realized we were in love. <laughs> so we dated for two months, got engaged, and got married within a year. And um, our families were astounded. And then four years later, I had a wonderful son. We had this wonderful son named Freddie, who was Freddie the Third, great guy. And as he got older, we realized he had some issues, and sensory integration dysfunction was the first one that showed up. But as he went along in school and education, we realized that he had high-functioning autism, and he was on the autism spectrum. So I was introduced to the world of special ed. Um, which is an amazing world, and there's some amazing legal protections for you within special ed. So we would go to these things called IEP meetings, and I would read my, all about my son and his care and audiology reports and occupational therapy reports and everything, and I was part of that committee. And then we had another son, because <laughs> we, you know, we were brave. And, um, and he's Isaac, and he's spectacular, and he runs around all the time, and he's four now. And that was our life. And then... In January of 2009, my husband um, was complaining of pain in his ribs. And he went to the doctor, um, the hospital, and they said, well, you know, it looks like you broke a rib from coughing, because you've got that bad cough everybody had right then. I thought, well, he's only 38. That's awful young to break a rib from coughing, but if that's what the doctors say. And then in February, he started having really severe lower back pain. And um, he went to the doctor again and again, and the doctor said, well, it looks like you have a protuberance of lumbar five. Let me give you some pain medication for that. And he kept going back because the pain kept getting worse. Matter of fact, it got so bad that my son's rolling backpack that my son used to go to school, my husband started using to go to school to teach his classes because he couldn't actually carry the books anymore because it hurt too bad. And every week he was going back to the doctor. And on March 13th, he hurt so bad, and this was a Friday, that I said, why don't we go to, a, to an emergency room and, and just find out what's wrong because you keep going to the doctor and we keep not finding out why you're hurting so much. 
And we packed up the family and we went to this beautiful emergency room. I loved that emergency room. There were beautiful couches, there were stained glass windows, there was art on the walls, it was gorgeous. And we sat there for three hours. And we waited, and we waited. Till somebody came to us who was from Evan uh, Express Wound Care and they said, you know, we're really backed up tonight, so we're really not gonna be able to do much for, your, for you or your family. Maybe an x-ray, you look a little bit anemic. Go back to your doctor next week, but here's some pain medication. So the next week, I went with my husband to the doctor's appointment. And I watched them take him into the room and not weigh him, which was pretty standard procedure in my book. And the doctor looked at us and said, hmm, you're back again. I said, yes, my husband's in a lot of pain and we really want to find out what's going wrong. And she said, do you think maybe you could be depressed? I said, yeah, he's real depressed because he's in excruciating pain all the time. So we would like an MRI and to find out what's wrong with my husband's back. So she said, well, I think there's some places in Virginia that I can see you in a couple weeks. I said, no, we want an MRI tomorrow. So what place can see us tomorrow? And there was an open MRI facility in only Maryland that could see my husband that very next day. And he went down there and he got his MRI and they gave him a little CD and he took the little CD and he went to his doctor's office and he gave it to her on a Friday. And the following Tuesday, she called us up. She said, I've looked at the results of that CD you dropped off, and um, I'd like you to have an appointment with an oncologist tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. Well, you know, I was a den leader and an artist and all that stuff, but I wasn't quite sure what an oncologist was. So I got on the internet. Well, the internet told me that's a cancer doctor. He just has back pain, right? So we went to the hospital and we took him there and he was in so much pain. And the doctor, the oncologist who was gonna see him, said, you know, you're in so much pain, why don't we admit you? Because then you don't have to go everywhere for tests, right? So we got admitted. And he was there all day that day and the next, and I stayed with him as much as I could. But by Friday, I had to go to work. And I went to work. And at around 10.30 in the morning on that Friday, my husband was in his room alone when the oncologist came in his room and said, to my husband, some really bad news. So at 11 o'clock in the morning, I was working at the toy store and I was selling toys. I was helping people with birthday presents when I got a phone call from my husband. And he said, Reggie, the doctor was just in my room and he said something about tumors and growths and something about a three centimeter tumor. And could you please come here because I really don't understand what's going on and I left the toy store. And I got there in 30 minutes to the hospital to help my husband and find out what exactly was said to him. And the oncologist had just left town for a medical convention and he would be gone for the next four days and unreachable by cell phone. So I would spend the next four days going from person to person, internist, nurse, anybody, trying to find out what was going on. What was the diagnosis? What, what, what exactly, where are these, where's the metastases? How big are these tumors? What's happening to my husband? By Sunday, an oncologist who was on call came in our room. I was sitting there with my in-laws and my husband. We were desperate for information. She just went over, looked at him, went back to the hallway to the computer, came back in, and we said, well, do you have the results? She said, the results? You know, those tests that you had, the, the PET scan, the bone scan that you guys did, what, what were the results? Oh, you mean nobody's told you? No, we just had the first test and that said he had tumors in his abdomen. Oh, well, um, yeah, we have the results back. It shows that the cancer spread. It's in his bones and his lungs. And then she left. And that night I went home and I got on the internet and looking at all the things that I'd been told verbally and looking at what the internet had to say, well, that meant my husband had stage four kidney cancer and the median survival rate wasn't very good at all. And nobody was telling us this. So I spent quite a long time trying to get information from everybody I could about my husband's medical record and was astounded at how little information was accessible and easily available. And I compared it to my son's IEP binder that I had at home and a school system that trusted me as a parent, that I could understand information and be part of a team and help provide care. And a lot of
of people when I've talked about data access say, well, I go to my doctor, they just give me stuff. I don't know what you're talking about. You must have not tried very hard. Well, I want to tell you another little story. My husband was a huge Stephen King fan, and he wanted to read a really important book to him that was coming out in November, and it was called Under the Dome. Well, my husband's sick, and it's March, and I've read on the internet how long he's probably going to live is about two to three months. So on April 3rd, I contact the book buyer at the toy store and say, I have a very special favor for you. And I do this all by email. I need a copy, a galley copy of Under the Dome, because I don't think my husband's going to live long enough to read it himself. So please. And she did. She emailed the rep, and the rep emailed the publisher, and the publisher, he emailed Stephen King and said, can we get this book for this family? And they said yes. And on April 7th, they mailed that book out. So in about a week, we got a book that wasn't going to be published until November of 2009, a week via email on the internet. Well, as for a month, I was in the hospital asking for data and not being able to access it. And that's the spreadsheet of all of that and all the amazing steps that were needed just trying to get a book, which was really linear, but trying to get information. Nurse couldn't give it. Internist would give me three minutes at a computer. Oncologist just filled out paperwork. Social worker just filled out paperwork. But nobody was letting us see the information. And this is what it felt like, because I'm an artist, so I paint things. And that's me kneeling in front of that doctor just begging to get the information and writing in my little journal what he says and asking him to please slow down because I don't understand all the words you're using. I have to write these down and then I research them on the internet at night so I can provide care. He says, I don't like people who do internet research. Well, I said, well, I don't have a background in medicine, so my only way of understanding is to research. He says, that's right. I have the medical degree. And that's why in that painting right there, that certificate on the back wall says, I have the medical degree. Because that's the point he put me in, and I'm kneeling in that painting because I was kneeling emotionally and begging for help. And this is the difference between accessibility within traditional social media and the internet and what's available at the hospital. Limited Wi-Fi access, communication by a corded phone, you, almost no email between providers. To communicate with a hospital, ambulatory services, radiation, you have to do it by phone. Whereas the World Wide Web, social media, ACOR, all the amazing services that are out there that are innovating, that's happening in Health 2.0, is not communicating with what's going on within traditional institutions. If we can get that data, that important data that you have, and we can combine it with the ability to research that's available on the internet, imagine the world that we can have. Imagine the care that we can get. And imagine that that survey we had before, the major improvement that we could have within care would be patient access to this information. Because we are not going to get change within the system until we have that, and we have that universally. So I finally got that record after a month of trying to get it, and after, unfortunately, them doing a major, major paperwork mistake. And I got a copy, and I got to read it. And when I got that copy, you know what I did with it? I created a visual version of the medical fact sheet, the face sheet that's in front of everybody's you know, information. But I painted it about five by six on a wall in a local delicatessen in Washington, D.C. So every time you go to there to eat like your salmon and lox, you see my husband's medical chart at in-stage cancer painted on the wall. Because I want people to think about this, think about it in every aspect of your life. And then I painted another painting. This is called 73 Cents. And I painted this from June 23rd to September 30th. And it became part of the healthcare debate. And it became part of meaningful use. And this is what it feels like to be embraced by social media. This is a woman who contacted me by Twitter. Her name is Shira Bell. And she does a caregiving service. And she's an amazing woman. And she wears a jacket that I painted for her that shows somebody dying of cancer. And she wears it to the AMA. She brings the patient in the room, and she shows you how very hard this is, but we want to work with you. We want to make this better. So that's my son Isaac, and he's waiting for the bus. And I want you to remember one thing also, is that when we look at other systems, look at retail, look at childcare, look at busing, people have solved a lot of these things. The paper transfer is not used in Washington, D.C. to go on the bus anymore. We have smart cards. We scan them. Guess what? There's less fraud. There's better aggregation of data. And we... You get good ideas of what traffic patterns are, you save money. It's amazing. And that's within busing. Why can't we do that within medicine? 
Another thing that I did after our entire care situation happened was, well, I'm now a Kaiser Permanente man member. And I did this specifically because I want that patient portal. I want to know my after-visit summary, I want my lab results, and I want to be able to help my children. I never want to be put in another situation where information is denied to us that could make us have a better life. And then I want you to think about this igniting, sparking innovation concept. I love the triangle. You know, triangles are made of angles and planes, okay? And you're really focusing on the, those goals, those angles. But remember the planes, too. I'm a Cub Scout den leader, and I know you know the problem. You commit to a solution, and you practice till you get good results. And when you think about the H in HIT, don't just think health. Think hope. Don't think hassle of paperwork or problems in hospitals. But every time you think of this, you think of holiday. Fred Holiday, a person, not the patient in room 6218. Thank you.